Hello out there and welcome everybody to Amateur Radio Roundtable. This show is about ham radio, amateur radio, and we're sure glad to have you with us tonight. And especially if you're out there listening on international shortwave frequencies on 7490 kilohertz on WBCQ. We'd love to hear from you. Tell us where in the world you are and how you're hearing the uh, show tonight. We'd love to uh, hear that, uh, uh, get that feedback from you. And if you would, just send an email Tom at W5KUB.com, and uh, would love to hear from you. Um, everybody, please hit that subscribe button. You know, we need you to hit that subscribe button. I'm going to help you out right there. There's a little arrow that kind of points down here. There should be a subscribe button somewhere. Uh, hit that button. It helps us a whole, out a whole lot uh, to advertise our show. Uh, also, um, uh, you need to join our Facebook group. Our Facebook group, you know, uh, Facebook has changed everything around now. Yeah, everything's, I don't know, public, private, whatever. Nobody knows what it is. But uh, uh, I don't think our account goes up anymore because we are public. If we went private, we might have a number. But anyway, our number was up to about 13,000 people in our group uh, before. And I think that's probably the number that's going to sit at right now because... Uh, people can come into the group and out of the group and not be counted the way Facebook works now. Who knows? Anyway, join our Facebook group of 13,000 plus, and you can join that by just uh, keying in W5KUB uh, in the search bar, and you will uh, you will um, be a part of our uh, Facebook group. We'll, we'll approve you and get you right in here. I guess we have to approve you now. I don't know. Uh, hey, we're on, again, we're on uh, every podcast carrier out there, iTunes, Google Play, uh, iNet Radio, uh, all the guys out there, so you can find us anytime, day or night, you can listen to us while you're driving or at work or download us, whatever you want to do. I forgot to show you, there's a picture of WBCQ and their antenna out there, and there's their feed line. Uh, that's way up in Monticello, uh, Maine up there, where it looks like it snows a lot up here. So anyway, that's kind of the scoop there. We'd love to uh, again hear hear from you. We're glad you're uh, we're glad you're with us tonight. Uh, today is Tuesday, uh, September twenty seventh, twenty twenty two. We kind of got a special show tonight. Uh, I'll tell you a secret. Uh, Glenn and I, Glenn's with me right now. Glenn and I kind of pre recorded this, and we're going to piece it together and. Uh, we're going to uh, kind of be recorded tonight. Uh, we've got some things going where we can't quite make it live, so uh, that's what you get tonight. But I hope you still enjoy it, dear. Let's pull Glenn in. Glenn, how you doing tonight, man? Oh, I'm doing real good. Uh, wanted to let you know that my 9700 came in, the one I had to buy instead of win. But, yeah, mine came in, and uh, it's in the box over here getting ready to go. Um, got a couple little bits of news. Um, I'm in the process of signing the contract for the uh, best of Arduino books from ARRL, and that's going to be the best projects out of the first three books. And we're hoping to have that in ARRL's hands for in uh, the end of December, which means hopefully it'll be out in time for Dayton next year. And I'm in the final stages of signing a contract for another book that I should be able to talk about here in a couple more weeks. But that's kind of what's got going on. Took a little bit of a break this week and went to the Mid-South Fair and uh, had a lot of fun. A really, really good time there. So, uh, you know, just took my little miniature vacation. So we're good to go. Well, that's great, man. And, uh, man, I, you know, I used to love to go to that fair, but I haven't gone in a number of years, man. Uh, well, they had a uh, a, a live uh, sea lion <clears throat> show there that was just that right? absolutely fabulous. You know, uh, I, uh, I I went to high school over in Arkansas, and uh, I was a member of the FFA, you know. And I, I, there was some good stuff in the FFA. I learned how to weld and do, you know, woodwork and all kinds of stuff. But the main reason we joined the FFA there is we got – to uh, take off from school, and they drove us yep. down to the uh, Mid South Fair, uh, you know, uh, every year, and uh, that was kind of the highlight, you know, of the uh, the uh, uh, FFA. But anyway, uh, hey, I hadn't been a long time, uh, but uh, I still think it's neat, and uh, we'll probably try to make one here soon. Well, you know, maybe. they moved it to South Haven 
from yeah. downtown Memphis. So it's just a you know little mile and a half from me. Well, and there's a, there's another one, and I don't know what are the, I they don't know call what that the, the Delta Fair. The Delta Fair, and that's just not too far from me uh, up here. Right. So well, there's several fairs out there now, so that's that's kind of cool. And we're finally yeah. getting into a little bit of fall, although yesterday it was just really really hot. <clears> but um, you know we're supposed to start cooling down and start raining, and it's not you know winter's just around the corner. Yeah. Well, it, it cooled off enough yesterday that I actually was able to get my rotors back together. Oh, I don't have pictures, but if you guys remember the pictures from last week, the base I had the rotor stand on, it was all rotted. And, boy, when I got up here and took it down, the, it was really rotted. We put a new uh, we put a new uh, pallet up there. I painted the pallet so it'll last longer. And um, we uh, got it all back together up there. And, uh, hey, I'm going to walk over here just a minute and show you both rotors are turning out man That's yippee cool. uh wow yeah so i haven't had time yet to get on uh, or even hook the 9700 up or get on satellite or anything i do have the antennas working hey it may be winter time before i can get anything inside here working but at least i got the antennas out there working so uh that was uh that was great to uh, to get done there uh, yeah that's kind of the way i am i need to get up on the roof and fix my cobweb the pine trees and uh, ice storm last year took down yeah. a couple of the legs of it yeah hey let me give you an update man we had a big surprise this week after 13 days w5kub-112 had been uh radio silent for 13 days but w we weren't too worried because uh, uh 112 went up into the arctic and um the sun uh, up there is out all day every day but the sun never gets above about five degrees and uh, we need 20 degrees to work so uh, uh, it was just in a radio silent uh, no no voltage to operate uh, uh, while we were up there the last 13 days it did uh, continue on across uh, Greenland and around and, and across that way and uh, uh, came back down in Russia again near where uh, it it went up from into the uh, Arctic. So I don't know. We've got to watch it the next few days and see where it is. We're still getting very uh, a few reports from it. Uh, conditions are not good there. Um, and um, we're gonna we're working on some things to try to get uh, more power and so forth there. So anyway, I, I think it's, good. it's still flying. We're at 43,000 plus feet. So we're still flying uh, after, uh, I think we're at 100 I think we're like at 107 days now or something uh, in our flight. Uh, I started, I, I, I didn't know when it was going to come out. Some of the balloons, when they go up into the uh, Arctic, they could stay up here five months before they come out. And uh, there's been a number of them that have done that. I didn't want to wait that long before we got another one back in the air. This one did pop out. Of course, it may pop back in there. But anyway, I'm, I'm uh, in the process now of... Uh, uh, building up KUB, uh, W5KUB113. Uh, We're going to go ahead and get it launched, and it will be uh, it, it will be flying at the same time 112 is flying. Now this is going to be called uh, this is going to be called W5KUB-113 Heavy because we're going to try some some uh, some different things on this guy. Uh, you know, we like to keep it as light as possible. Uh, 112 is about 7.8 grams total. That's the antenna, tracker, everything. Uh, and because of that, you're limited to a lot of things you can do. So it's getting winter time. Oh, it's getting winter time, and we want, we're going to do an experiment. We've done this before, and it worked very well. We're going to do an experiment with, with some solar uh, cells here where we can get uh, power even down when the sun's at the horizon. And we've done this before uh, last winter. We used this configuration, and we actually started operating two degrees below sunrise, and it operated all the way to two degrees below sun, sunset. So it did really well. Now, if we had had that configuration on, on uh, 112 here up in the Arctic, We'd be getting transmissions all day, every day, you know, five degrees sun angle. So here's how we're going to do it, and here's why it's so much heavier. 
here's what so much heavier and let me show you what uh, what 112 looks like let me get now, it are here. you gonna do you have a hab hub track on 112 right now uh well yes it is <clears throat> it is out there <clears throat> on okay, hab cool. hub and aprs so so this is basically the solar panel that i built up here this is what 112 would have and it, it's flying it's flying horizontal just like this the strings come up from all four corners it's flying horizontal so you can see the sun has to come in the sun has to be kind of high before this thing will start operating and it has to be within 20 20 degrees or more and if the sun's down at five degrees you can see it never got any sun but it's and you can see too you can see how light this is uh, this is only a couple of grams but here's what here's what 113 is going to be flying look at the difference you can see that let's see that's outstanding you can see the difference on 113 yeah let me do it like that there you go so 112 is flying this but you can see on on uh 113 we've got cells at 90 degrees from each other and uh, we've got uh, we've got an extra cell. We've got seven cells on each side, so each side is duplicated. Uh, here we're only running six cells. So normally six cells would get us by. Seven gets us a little bit more voltage. Uh, but if we want to try to pick up the sun at a lower angle, see we can't just you can't just uh, you can't just tilt one set of panels like this. If you tilt one set of panels like this, and, and say the sun's over here. Oh, well, that's great, but what if the sucker's flying like this? What if it's flying like this and the sun's over there? You don't get any sun. So we have found that it doesn't necessarily take a pyramid or a triangle, but if we put panels on two sides at a 45, we can easily pick up the sun from, from sunrise and, and in the winter, of course, the winter of the sun is lower and lower in the winter time. The sun's never going to get higher than about 45 degrees out there. So, hey, when the sun gets at 45 degrees, that's going to be dead on uh, to these. So, uh, so uh, with it tilted, we're adding a second duplicate panel over here on the other side. That's just in case this thing, you know, is turning around a little bit or something. Uh, but uh, even if it's flat side, it's not facing the sun. Let's say the sun is here and it's, it's kind of more pointing toward it you can still see the sun can still come in and hit hit the panels as long as it's 20 degrees so this is about 10 grams as, as I mentioned our, uh, our 112 is 7.8 grams total just this piece right here is 10 grams so we're gonna come in at about 13 grams on uh, 113 so we're gonna call him uh, W5 KB 113 heavy and we're gonna uh, we're gonna be flying him and we're going to run some new code in there that uh, uh, it helps to uh, make the timing more accurate uh, for more uh, uh, more reception reports. Plus, I've been testing today. I've been testing today a hundred watt. P I mean, who? Ooh, I wish well, 100 a hundred watts? hundred wow. milliwatt. Hundred milliwatt oh, power amplifier I built up. Uh, that's about a gram, and. Uh, uh, I've tested it with the, with the seven seven cells outside in the sun today, and uh, it, the voltage is up there. It's running the PA. It's running the tracker, and uh, the thing's drawing about 120 milliamps out of those cells. So it's doing it's doing pretty good, and and it's a little bit of hazy today here. Uh, you get this tracker up in, up above the clouds up there where the ultraviolet is high. And, uh, you know, it's going to be, they'll put out even a little bit more voltage and current up here. So that's, that's where we're going. And uh, hopefully we'll get uh, 113 lots here maybe in the next uh, uh, weeks with the 100, 100 milliwatt PA. It's going to run somewhere between, depending on the voltage, uh, it's going to run somewhere between about 75 milliwatts to 100 milliwatts. That's the range it's going to kind of fly at and uh we've been flying at 10 milliwatts so you can see there's going to be a, a significant improvement there hey okay that's enough about that right there we need to move on in the show here well one thing real quick yeah, yeah uh what is your altitude projection with that extra weight 
Well, uh, I need to do the spreadsheet, but uh, I've done I've done several spreadsheets before with putting in even 15 grams of weight, and it's still showing up in the 45 thousands. Cool. So I think uh, you know I think we're going to be okay. Uh, you know, uh, with a small balloon and that weight, you used to couldn't fly, but about 32,000 or 28,000. And uh, right. these new balloons we found are really, really doing great, man. They'll, they'll do some altitude. So, you know, hey, we started this uh, 112 flight off really high, about 51,000. No air up there. Uh, the air, what a well, little bit was up there, wasn't moving very much. It took 80 days to go around the world the first time. Wow. Our, our best our best flight around the world has been nine days, but being above the jet stream, it took 80 days uh, to get there. So, yeah, we're hoping at 45,000, uh, we'll be kind of catching some air there, and maybe we'll be heading east. And, you know, I think on an average, if you can get around the world in 20 days, that's, that's a, pretty good, uh, a, a pretty good pace there. So that's what we're hoping for. Looking forward to seeing this. Yeah. One. All right. Hey, uh, hey, we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, we're going to. There, there's been some uh, people asking, and we're going to. We're going to have your forum tonight on your okay. your Arduino. Tell us, tell us just real quick in a few words, uh, the title and what they're going to be looking at tonight. Yeah, this one is titled Arduino: The Next Generation, and this is a brand new forum that I put together. Um, it is basically. Taking the Arduino, or where do you go with the Arduino once you've kind of outgrown the Nano and the Uno? And it was basically the story of my search for the best uh, next-level Arduino in terms of horsepower, memory, and everything. And this was the forum that I did in Huntsville, and I kept it really quiet as to where this forum was going. Um, just kind of as part of the fun and uh, planned all this for Huntsville, and it went over really, really well. I'm really happy with this forum, and it's going to lead into the book that follows the current one I'm working on for ARRL. Uh, I've got about actually six or seven book projects in the pipeline, and there is a book uh, with ARRL, uh, and at the end of this uh, the show we'll we'll discuss those books, because if I told you now, you'd know what the presentation's all about, and that ruins half the fun. But uh, this should be a lot of fun. This is the forum live that I did in Huntsville, and we recorded it, and we had like one glitch in the middle because um, one of our phones ran out of memory, so we had to switch phones real quick. But you didn't lose any information, and uh, it should be a really fun watch. It runs about an hour with the uh, the presentation and the, the Q&A that follows. The Q&A that goes with it is pretty cool, too. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's, that's great. I know a lot of people have requested it. And uh, of course, they'll be able to see it. it. It's it'll be recorded on our show tonight. Now it's already posted up on our channel, so some of you people may have already uh, checked our channel out and found found uh, the forum and uh, and watched it. But uh, it'd be good to watch again. And uh, so let's uh, let's jump over there and take a look at the forum now. And we'll be back with you. Uh, uh, well, I'll tell you what. First, let's take a quick break. Keep your competitive contesting edge with Icon. ICOM's high-powered base stations cut through the pileups, letting you work the bands and record those contacts. Contest from the comfort of your home or remotely with the RS BA1 app. The IC7851 gives you a new window into the RF world and is HF excellence unparalleled. With faster processors, higher input gain, higher display resolution, and a cleaner signal, it is truly the pinnacle of HF perfection. It has dual receivers digital IF filters, high-resolution spectrum waterfall. The IC7610 is a direct sampling software-defined radio that has changed the world's definition of an SDR transceiver. Features include RF direct sampling, 110 dB RMDR, independent dual receivers. Create your own band opening with the IC9700. This transceiver brings direct sampling to the UHF-VHF weak signal world. This all-mode transceiver is loaded with innovative features that are sure to keep you very busy. It has fast processors, higher input gain, higher display resolution, and a cleaner signal. Included are real-time high-speed spectrum scope and waterfall display, smooth satellite operation with 99 satellite channels, dual watch operation, and full duplex 
operation in satellite mode. The IC7300 is the high-performance innovative HF transceiver with a compact design and it will far exceed your expectations. This innovative HF transceiver digitizes RF before various receiver stages, reducing inherent noise in different IF stages. The IC7300 changed the way entry-level HF is designed. Features include RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, a large 4.3 inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope. For more information on ICOM radios, visit www.icomamerica.com slash amateur. All right, so we're back. Hey, guys, it's time now. Let's take a look at this forum and see what Glenn has uh, to uh, say about, what is it? The next uh, Arduino, generation. The next Arduino. generation. Arduino, the next generation. Yeah, man. I, I couldn't even say Arduino a few years ago. I <laughs> yeah, still I know don't, it. I still don't even know if I can spell it. But uh, anyway, here we go. So here we go. And it's new to me. I've been putting this together for the last month and a half thereabouts. And I honestly I don't know what's in it. And it's the thing is, I have kept this very quiet. Uh, at this point, there are probably only five to six people on the planet that know. And three of them are being watched. <laughs> so and, they say... And two cats. You know, they're probably streaming it right now. Who's <laughs> watching them? <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> uh, but yeah, literally, this has been a hush hush project. Uh, in that, and it's not anything hush hush, it's just I wanted to release it here and announce it here because I love Huntsville. And I think you guys would appreciate where I'm going. Now, you have to understand. I'm here to have fun. The Arduino is supposed to be fun. I am here to have fun. And please hold your questions to the end. Feel free to laugh your guts out if you wish. Throw tomatoes if you want. And uh, you know what? They're too expensive now. No, that's true too. I'm saved by the bell. You gonna melt my boots? Yeah. yeah, just throw your shoes at me. <laughs> okay. And also on the leg, too. There you go. Okay, I'm Glenn Popio, KW5GP. I write the ARRL Arduino books, and I also wrote uh, their high speed multimedia book, which is basically microwave and mesh networking. And I actually saw a couple of copies down at uh, the JMR sales booth, which is now Chat Radio. And so there's a couple of signed books of that down there if you want them. But now let's go ahead and get into this. Like I say, I have not seen a lot of these slides or don't remember seeing them because they were done at midnight. <laughs> Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship. Oh, crap. Wrong presentation. <laughs> I think I fix this. That was for somebody else. Let's uh, try this one more time. That's the wrong next generation. <laughs> So who am I? I'm a network engineer and technology consultant for HCC Global Services in Memphis, Tennessee. I was first licensed as a ham back in 1973. We drove the Flintstone cars back then. Uh, I've got over 45 years in the computer and electronics field. Today I'm doing my uh, networking and network engineering. I started out doing jet engine remote data acquisition systems, telemetry and control on projects such as the SR-71 the F-14, 15, 16, and a whole host of others, including the Black Hawk helicopter. And uh, I'm also author of ARRL's Arduino for Ham Radio book series, along with the occasional QST article and product review. I also show purebred cats, as Bill discussed here. Uh, I had the 15th best of all cats and the best Maine Coon female in the world in 1989, and it's a boy's world. Uh, and that included winning a Best in Show at Madison Square Garden, which at the time was the equivalent of the Westminster Dog Show, except it's for cats. My current pair are actually from that same genetic line. They're litter sisters, and they're also world champions. They double as editorial assistants, <laughs> parts thieves. Let me tell you stories about the parts thefts. Project build supervisors and general nuisances. And typical of most editors, they have to work with my 
material. Um, when they try to get on the editorial work, they got to sleep on it first. And while they have fancy registered names, they're nicknamed Godzilla and Rodan for obvious reasons. I think one of the reasons that I enjoy the Maine Coon is that they are basically Kit Kats. And I know you came here for the Arduino, but there's a purpose here. <laughs> they come from the factory like this. You now they're not fully assembled. <laughs> All you have to do is add food and water, and you get this. Godzilla is 22 pounds, 3 feet 4 inches long. That's a few inches over a meter, so spread your arms and, and carry 22 pounds. So grab two 10-pound sacks of potatoes. Uh, her sister, I call the small one, has got a 5-foot, 9-inch vertical leap. Stand up for a second. Miss Oshan? Oh, yeah. She's the height of the lady in here to give you an idea of how big this thing is. And I call her the little one. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. And I told you all of that just so I could tell you this. Both are now world famous calendar girls, along with, <laughs> along with Dave Minster's cat, who's on the cover. Of the 2022 ARRL calendar that features cats and shacks. <laughs> <laughs> Had to do that. And unfortunately, that's no longer available, so go beat up on Dave Minster and tell him you want him in there again. My latest book, More Arduino for Ham Radio, is also now available from ARRL. This book includes another group of completely new and unique ham radio related projects. Some of these projects are actually multiple projects within a project. So you see 10 projects in the book. No, it's more like 15 and 20 once you actually get into the projects. So there's a whole lot of new projects that you can build. So now, let's get into the Arduino part, which is why you're here. First, we need to set our Wayback Machine to 1988. How many of, them, how many of you remember Sherman and Peabody? <laughs> I love them. I grew up with them. Uh, in 1988, I wrote a magazine article that predicted the future of computer technology. The article was titled, How Far Are We From How? And it was a discussion of how the computer and Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 A Space Odyssey, the computer technology of 1988, and what technological advances would need to take place to create a computer similar to how. The article outlined the advancements that would be needed in processing power, speech, voice recognition, and vision technologies. It also covered the advances that would be required in storage. Remember, in 1988, PC memory was extremely limited, as was the disk, and it's expensive. You know, back then, one meg of memory cost 550 bucks. A 30 meg hard drive cost 450 bucks, and that's in 1988 dollars. One simple photo today would have filled up that entire hard drive. So we're talking megabytes, not gigabytes or terabytes. The article even predicted solid state disk technology and the demise of magnetic tape. 1988, I thought I did pretty good. All in all, mainly a result of some very lucky guesswork and my lucky magic eight ball. <laughs> um, that article really did prove to be quite prophetic. In fact, the lowly Arduino can and is doing a lot of things that was predicted in that article today. And it's doing it with very inexpensive components. We don't even think twice about such things as Alexa, the Ring doorbell, and the other advanced technologies that we use today. For reference, the control data supercomputers used by NASA back in the Apollo missions had a 60-bit CPU running at 10 megahertz with 982K of RAM, and that was magnetic core memory. In many respects, the UNO is equally as powerful as those multi-million dollar room filling monsters, and it uses far less power than the 30 kilowatts each that those 6600s used. I often spoke of the computer world eventually unifying under a single programming language that would, or programming environment, that would work with whatever hardware vendor you chose. Hello, Arduino. <laughs> While we're not quite there, and probably never will be 
we're really close. The Arduino comes very close to proving that one language to rule them all to be quite prophetic as well. I don't have enough hands. When are we going to evolve to have three hands, four hands? So let's dig out my trusty old Magic 8 ball that I used to write that article. We're going to shake it up and see what it can tell us. But oh, by the way, did you know that these things kind of get a little volatile with the fluid inside after <laughs> they've been sitting up for a number of years? Um, shaking this one up might not be a good idea. So instead, it's time for an upgrade. Did you know it's actually fairly easy to open up a Magic 8 ball? You can remove the inside. The key component is a 20-sided die that's inside a liquid-filled cylinder. Like that. And all you got to do is cut around the edge of the seam. So it cleans out pretty easy. So why don't we take an Arduino Nano, a 128 by 32 pixel organic LED, and put it inside. Then, a customized sketch based on the Instructables uh, website's Magic 8 Ball with an Attitude um, can then be loaded on the Nano. And as you can see, it does indeed have an attitude. Now, before we rattle this new genie's cage, let's look back on where we've come from. The Arduino has definitely come a long way since 2005. There are now all manner of Arduinos and Arduino variants, in addition to the original Arduino Uno and Nano that I have traditionally used to build some really cool projects. Most of these new microcontrollers are supported in the Arduino IDE and are every bit as easy to program as the original Arduino Uno. The Arduino Uno and Nano both use the AT Mega 328 chip, which gives us an 8-bit 16 megahertz CPU, 32K of flash, 2K of RAM, 1K of double EEPROM. It's got 14 digital I.O. pins, and six of those can do pulse width modulation. It's got six analog inputs, and the Nano actually has eight that go to a 10-bit analog to digital converter. These analog pins can also be used for digital I.O. if you need additional digital I.O. pins. It's powered by 7 to 20 volts DC with a regulator on the board, or via the onboard USB port. It also has an SPI and an I2C bus on the board. But I also found some new ones that we really need to include in this discussion. You've got the, the Pico, and this is not to be confused with the Raspberry Pi Pico. It is the size of a dime. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the Mini Uno, which is the size of a quarter. And they both use the AT Mega 328, but they have a smaller footprint. The Mini Mega at the bottom, uh, you gentlemen were talking earlier, the AT Mega 2560. It is the 2560, but it's three quarters the size of an Uno. But now it's time to take a giant leap. You've always heard me say that when it comes to the Arduino, that you're only limited by your imagination. I still feel that nothing can be more true than that simple little statement. For my first three Arduino books, I focused mainly on the Uno and Nano, and primarily because of their low cost, simplicity, and ease of use. But there's one thing that you don't know, and that I really wouldn't talk about. I was embarrassed. And I do need to warn you from this point forward, please make sure that your seatbelt and shoulder restraint are firmly fastened. Make sure your tray, tray table's in the full and upright position, because we're about to crank things up to about an 11 or 12. And if you don't have a seatbelt and restraint, raise your hand. Um, we will see that somebody holds you down. <laughs> I was on a quest. I've been constantly looking for the perfect next level Arduino processor board. To create advanced projects, I knew that I'd need more CPU horsepower, more memory, everything than the Uno and Nano could provide. I needed more I.O., a higher resolution A to D, more flash memory, more RAM. I needed the kitchen sink. 
and it had to be inexpensive. In other words, I seek the grail. <laughs> During my quest, I found Arduino-compatible boards that came close to what I was looking for, but were not quite it. The STM32 family that includes the Blue Hill is inexpensive, it's fast, it integrates in the Arduino IDE, and meets much of the criteria. But the various versions of the board may or may not come with the Arduino bootloader pre-installed. And it uses a slightly different sketch upload procedure, so you might have to go through some extra steps to bring it fully into the Arduino IDE environment. The ESP32 and 8266 are also close. And they come with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and other features, and they're inexpensive. But again, they just miss triggering my grail detector, which, of course, it's Arduino powered. The STM32 is a family of microcontrollers, and my memory stops, based on the ARM Cortex-M series of CPUs. The Blue Pill version has a 72 megahertz compared to the 16 of the Uno, uh, Cortex-M3. It's got 64K of flash, 20K of RAM. It's got 32 digital I.O. pins. 12 of those are capable of pulse width modulation. You've got 14 analog input pins, three serial UART pins, um, two SPI buses, two I2C buses, and it's a whopping $3. Wow. But depending on where you get it, the board may or may not have the Arduino bootloader pre-installed, and this requires those extra steps to fully be used with the Arduino IDE. Not the grail. The uh, Expressive ESP32 microcontroller is an updated version of the ESP8266, and it offers Wi-Fi along with both Bluetooth and Bluetooth BLE. Um, it's got, you can get it in available uh, 10 silica 32-bit CPU, and it, you can get them in 160 to 240 megahertz, <laughs> 4 to 16 mega flash. 38 to 77 I.O. pins. If you've got a project that needs 77 I.O. pins, talk to me about it. <laughs> we, we can make millions of dollars with whatever it is. Um, you've got up to 18 12-bit A to D pins. Same goes. Who needs 18? Um, two 8-bit D to A. This is a first. I like having the digital to analog capability. Uh, 10 capacitive touch switch sensors, 4 SPI channels, 2 I2C channels, three serial UARTs, up to eight channels of infrared remote control, up to 16 channels of pulse width modulation pins. It's even got an integrated Hall effect sensor on, on the chip, and it runs on 3.3 volts, and it costs about three bucks. Wow. It's a good option, especially with the integrated Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and I'll probably have some ESP32 projects in a future book, but it's not the grail. Here are some other boards that came close. Early on, the 80 megahertz 32-bit microchip UC32, formerly the Uno32, was a contender. But at over 50 bucks, it's still too expensive to want to work with. I'm cheap. The TNC series of Arduinos comes very close, with the 4.1 having a 600 megahertz 32-bit ARM Cortex M7 processor, 8 mega flash, 1 mega RAM, and 4K of double EEPROM. It has 55 digital I.O. pins, 18 analog inputs, and a selectable A to D resolution of 10 or 12 bits, and a ton of other features. The 4.1 is so close to what I was seeking that there will most likely be some teensy projects in one of my future books. But again, at $32, it's a bit on the expensive side. So the quest continued, but I do have to admit I began to lose faith. Would I ever find what I was looking for? About a year or so ago, I was approached by ARRL to write a book on a ham radio related uh, ham radio related Python projects using a specific microcontroller board. I declined at the time as I felt that there was more for me to do with the Arduino, and still it warranted a second look. <clears throat> on the hardware side, this new microcontroller fit the bill. It has a dual core, 133 megahertz ARM Cortex M0 Plus, 2 mega flash, 256K of RAM, 26 digital I.O. pins, and three 12-bit analog to digital inputs. And I bet you there's about a half dozen people in the room that know where I'm going right now. Okay. <coughs>
somebody blew my mind when I did a forum a couple weeks ago, and they're like, yeah, but I can't tell you. How much you know? 58 minutes. Are we ready? Yeah. Okay. It has two I2C buses, uh, two UARTs, and 16 of those pins can do pulse width modulation. It even has eight user programmable PIO state machines so that you can create your own custom hardware peripheral support. To add more icing to this cake, it has an on-chip real-time clock and temperature sensor, and its onboard MicroPython UG, supports two simultaneous processing threads, meaning that it can run two separate programs at the same time. But I didn't want to do Python, and the darn thing ran Python, or did it. At this point, I was still not convinced that I had found the grail. I did not want to learn Python. I did not care that the board cost a mere $4 if it meant that I had to learn Python. Period. End of story. I'm not interested. Cue the next news feed, please. Further research into this new microcontroller caused me to take a second look at Python. To this point, my impression on Python had been that it was a scripting language for PCs. I'm still not interested. Can't, can't get excited about it. But it turns out that that initial impression was not quite correct. Further investigation revealed that Python on microcontrollers is becoming more and more like the basic programming language we had back in the 1980s. It's simple, it's easy to learn, and it's easy to use. But doggone it, it was still Python. And it didn't integrate into the Arduino IDE, so why are we here talking about this thing? So we'd have to relearn everything that we knew. This cannot be the grail. Search continues. Next news feed. Detailed the operation of this microcontroller and revealed that it had features that allowed the user to change the programming language from the official MicroPython distribution to other language, such as SparkFun Circuit Python and a C, C++ compiler. The boot image could be changed with a simple press of the boot select button on the board. Still, there was no Arduino support. This is not the grail we're looking for. Let's clap those coconuts together and ride on. <laughs> but wait, there's more. The final piece of this message finally got through loud and clear. Earl Philhauer has created an unofficial translation of the Arduino ecosystem to the UF2 bootloader image that this new microcontroller uses, and it's available for free on GitHub. Then there came the announcement of an official Arduino bootload image for this new microcontroller. This means that this little $4 board now meets all of the conditions to be my holy grail of the Arduino world. But this new microcontroller comes from the most unlikely source. Could we have been looking in the wrong place this entire time? Let me introduce you to the Raspberry Pi Pico. <laughs> Indeed. Here's some sorcery in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Raspberry Pi. Well, not quite. It's the Raspberry Pi Pico. It's based on the RP2040 microcontroller family from, yes, the Raspberry Pi folks. Let's take a closer look. I still think this thing is fake. Can't be the real grill. Did someone spike our punch? Actually, on my way home from St. Louis in January, I picked up two, so they are real. It has a dual core, 133 megahertz on Cortex M0 Plus, 2 mega flash, 256K RAM, 26 digital I.O. pins, 16 can do pulse width modulation, 3 digital, 12-bit uh, digital, uh, I'm sorry, analog to digital inputs, 2 SPI buses, 2 I2C buses, 2 serial UARTs. It even has USB host capability, 8 PIO state machines. It's got an accurate on-chip real-time clock and a temperature sensor. sensor and it costs four dollars. And it's readily available today in spite of the chip shortage. I bought two of them at retail at Micro Center in St. Louis in January. For four dollars each. So in my opinion, this does have to be the grill. It has all the horsepower, memory, I.O., and a ton of other features to build some really nice Arduino projects. Think SDR. With the Arduino bootload image, it can seamlessly integrate into the Arduino ecosystem. Most of the existing Arduino modules and libraries are directly supported. For me, personally, this is the low-cost microcontroller I've been looking for in order to take my Arduino projects to the next level. 
and yet you retain the ease and simplicity of the Arduino development environment. No Python. <laughs> this quest has finally somehow managed to reach a happy ending. The future of Arduino projects for me looks very bright for now. But uh, does anybody know what those dark clouds off in the distance just might mean? But wait, before we go deal with that, there are several new versions of the Pi Pico that have just been released, and they're still in the four to six dollar range. The Pi Pico W now includes an onboard Wi-Fi chip. Chip supports 802.11b, G, and N modes. And while the chip itself supports Bluetooth Classic and Bluetooth BLE, the initial release of the Pico W will only support 2.4 gig Wi-Fi modes. The other two versions are the H and the WH, and these are simply the same first two boards with the headers pre-installed on the boards. But there's even more. Other vendors are now jumping on this bandwagon and creating boards based on the RP2040. The Wii Act RP20 is a Pico style board with 16 mega flash instead of the Pico mm -hmm. standard 2. If you can't do it in 16 megs, you know, mm -hmm. you're going to need a bigger boat. Mm -hmm. And it's only $8 from AliExpress. The RP2040 Zero board is based on the RP2040, but with a smaller footprint and fewer I.O. pins, again, close to the size of a dime, and it's $6 from AliExpress. And these are readily available. I, get the, I got them about three weeks from China. And there's even more. The Lilygo T Pico C3, there's a mouthful, has both the Raspberry Pi Pico 2040 and an ESP32 C3 on a single board. And they threw in a 125 by 240 pixel 1.14 inch <laughs> color TFT display. All on this one little itty bitty board. The ESP32 C3 is a single core 32 bit 160 megahertz CPU with 400K of RAM. 384k of flash with 22 programmable I.O. pins, onboard Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and has an onboard JST connector so you can hook up a LiPo battery. Switching between the Pico and the ESP32 is done simply by turning the USB-C programming cable over. <laughs> an onboard LED, isn't that neat? Yes. An onboard LED will light green or blue to indicate which processor is active. And this is only $13. That is Everything's right there on one little board. But there's still more. The Lilygo T Display RP2040 is a 2040 board with that same display, and it includes an onboard JC. It just doesn't have the STM32, and it's 13 bucks. Finally, the RP2040 Development Board has an onboard 70 by 40 pixel, 0.42 inch liquid crystal display. It also features a QWICC I2C, too many initials, connector. And it's $12 from Banggood. So as you can see, there is already an ever broadening list of choices for the Pico type board. So you're not limited just to Raspberry Pi's distribution. And let's just throw one or two more in for good measure. The Pimeroni Tufty 2040 has a built-in 2.4 inch color display. It's designed to be a color LCD badge. Has five push button switches and a JST connector for external power. Runs on three AAAs or a LiPo battery. It's 28 bucks. But unfortunately, the shipping cost is about the same coming from Europe, so a little bit high for right now. Hopefully, they'll, they'll get a stateside distributor. The Pimeroni Badger 2040 uses the e ink display and it's 1650, but again, the shipping cost is still just a hair high. So where does this leave me? I'm currently working on a Best of Arduino due uh, to be turned into AWRL in December. This is the best projects in my mind from the first three books. So if you've got a favorite that you would like to see included in this book, now is the time to either send me an email or let me know and uh, I will see if there's room to stick it in that book because I'm still forming the book. I'm, it's, it's about half written, but there's, there's room. The projects will be upgraded with modern components such as color displays, new text-to-speech modules, and much, much more. And of course, the sketches themselves will be updated and new features are going to be added. Now, remember those dark clouds we talked about? Naturally, we're going to have to have a cliffhanger if I'm going to get you guys back here next year, right? So we got to leave room for a sequel. Everyone knows that real quests for knowledge are never ending, and it's true in this instance as well. 
again, as with any quest, this journey has changed and enlightened me. Part of the reason I'm a ham, work with microcontrollers, write the books, present these fun forums, and enjoy all the wonderful aspects of the amateur radio community is the personal challenge to research, discover, and continue to learn new and exciting things. This quest has indeed changed me. For lack of better words, I strayed too far into the light mm -hmm. while on this quest. My eyes have been opened to new and wonderfully exciting things, and I can't unsee what I have seen. I can't unlearn what I've learned. And I'm not sure I really want to. <clears throat> Nothing ever stays the same. In the world of ham radio, kit, and project building, electronics, and technology in general, nothing ever stays the same. Things are constantly changing. So here we are, standing on the edge of the future, looking at our magic eight ball again, and we're not going to shake that thing up. Uh, do we stay here, safe and secure in the Arduino world? <clears throat> or do we continue forward, walking on that razor's edge into the unknown? Now, I've already asked my magic eight ball and it knows this answer. So, let's shake that one again, the new one, <laughs> and see what it has to say. Yeah, I do love this new Magic 8 ball. <laughs> <laughs> Why not have the best of both worlds? It's not an exclusive environment here. As I've said, everything is constantly changing around us. This is also true in the microcontroller world. We'll always have the Arduino, but it seems the microcontroller world is moving towards Python-based microcontrollers. And why not? Python's been called the basic of the new millennium. It's easy to learn, and it's easy to use. And a cool thing about Python is that you can run it both interpretively and compiled. <coughs> this drastically speeds up your creative process and potentially saves you a ton of time waiting for your programs to compile, upload, oops, I had a bug, compile, upload again, doggone it, have a typo, upload again and again and again. So with Python and the interpretive, you can actually test it right there. So is this the end of Arduino? Absolutely not. Do not even think it. But it does say that we have more options than ever in regards to our microcontroller projects. Microcontrollers such as the Raspberry Pi Pico are just the leading edge of a whole new generation of microcontrollers. The multiple programming language capability of the Pico adds even more choices to our microcontroller arsenal. Now you can design and build with a single hardware platform and choose the programming language that's best for your project at hand. But for me, the thought on using Python on the computer yeah, I have to admit, it got me. It's kind of seductive. See, that's Python calling right now. <laughs> um, the Raspberry Pi Pico was designed around MicroPython and the ability to switch to a new programming environment later on down the road. It gives us a very flexible and long-lived development environment. The Arduino world is just now beginning to embrace the real-time real multi-threading and multitasking capabilities with such tools as the free RTOS, which is free real-time operating system, and this requires a higher-end Arduino. It won't run on the Uno and Nano. It needs you know, something you know, 70 meg and higher. The Python is inherently multi-threaded, and in the case of the Pico, you can natively run two programs simultaneously, one in each core. Which leads me to say, yet again, there are no limits. When it comes to the world of microcontrollers, you really are only limited by your imagination. As long as it doesn't violate the laws of physics. Now, if it does appear to violate the laws of physics, before you totally give up, try a bigger hammer, more voltage, <laughs> borrow my other magic eight ball, you know, something along that line to take care of it. But now for me, have I chosen wisely? <laughs> ARRL and I now have plans for at least two books beyond the Best of Arduino series. Both of those are going to focus on the Raspberry Pi Pico. The first book will use Pico and probably a few other microcontrollers using the Arduino programming language, the IDE, and the ecosystem. So it will be another Arduino book. The second book is going to be focused uh, on using the Raspberry Pi Pico and 
that word I can't say. Python. And, and I can't talk about this yet, there are even more books in the work. We are, as of this morning, we're actually now at a total of seven books. As fast as they can get turned out. I'm a one year a book kind of guy, so this is going to get fun. Uh, so, yeah, it's looking like that. We don't have the exact number because, quite honestly, we're still negotiating the price of my soul. <laughs> and does anybody have a Kelly Blue Book that might list the cost of a kind of old soul? <laughs> Just got a few dents and dings, good, good paint, you know, it runs good, sort of. <laughs> Had the engine rebuilt a few years ago. Um, <laughs> But your journey is just beginning. You are builders, thinkers, creators, and inventors. You're a perfect match for the Arduino and the microcontroller world. Now, imagine the projects that you can build now that you know this next level. You can build them with the Arduino and other microcontrollers. And then go make them happen. It's not that hard. It really isn't. And it's cheap. So with that... <laughs> I am done. Any questions, comments? Yes, sir. I thought in your requirements for the Grail, I thought you had listed analog output pins, but I did not see analog output pins listed in the Python code. That's correct. Analog output was not a requirement. Oh. I needed input. And if I need output, there are external chips that run on I2C that you can use in interface. When you have pulse width, what is your recommendation to get a very specific analog output voltage converted? Is uh, it like a digital potentiometer? When you, when you use pulse width, I'm generally not looking to generate a particular voltage. That's where you would need the D to A. I'm looking to uh, generate a a varying pulse, a, signal. A, a digital pulse to control motors, servos, and things that are pulse. It's all right. I yeah. haven't found a good answer anywhere. Yeah. For getting a very specific voltage to come out. Of for that. a very specific voltage, the only way that I know of is to use a digital to analog converter. He could probably use a Pi network that was controlled by but, a, a resistive D to A. Yeah, and that's actually listed in my <laughs> first or second book. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Did you, uh, you mention RTOS? Is that something that's compatible with the Python development environment? I don't know. Uh, at this point, RTOS was uh, designed for the Arduino, or the version that I'm familiar with. But it's Python. I am sure that they're going to have something similar right now, because Python was designed to be multi-threaded. So I think you're going to see a lot of that moving forward. You teased a uh, uh, software to SDR in one of your statements. Do mm -hmm. you think it would be possible to create a smart uh, receive antenna that uh, had the ability to digitize the signal at the antenna? Yeah, the question here is can you uh, digitize the received signal similar to an SDR and then transmit that digital down the line? And the answer would be yes. Uh, you can get a fast enough uh, A to D and do the slicing right there at the at the antenna end and, and then, then beat uh, it down over Ethernet. The uh, interface of using uh, the I2C as a bus? Well, your interface, you've, you've got a, the, the question was how, how would you interface this in the I2C bus? You can do it on I2C, but you also have Wi-Fi, the LoRa uh, modes uh, that work with the... Uh, uh, the industrial, the ISM band <coughs> stuff, uh, Adafruit's feather line, or you could go with Ethernet. And you, you could use any of those communications. I personally would go with Wi Fi. You can also use Bluetooth. Anybody else? Or are y'all just looking at me like I've gone crazy and over the deep end? <laughs> I've done that for years. Yeah, you've done that. Yes, sir. <laughs> Do you think uh, you, you'd be the perfect person to ask, obviously? I'm not perfect in anything. You'll be perfect at this, I'm, I'm predicting. Um, as we move, maybe we move away from the Arduino trademark name, we get into these things like 
I Pico and and, uh, and some of the others that you listed and and embedded Python. We move into that, and yet people still say, "Can you hand me a Kleenex?" Yes. Does our do do we know become the equivalent of Kleenex? <clears throat> I would say it's already become that way. Yeah. Because I I just call it an Arduino and it's a, an STM, and actually the Nano is not an official Arduino board. Yeah. And so. Yeah, I think it's just been all been covered that if it works with the IDE, technically it's an Arduino. And fortunately, because it's open source, they're not really enforcing that trademark per se. They are enforcing the Arduino product, but they're not really enforcing, you know, if it works with Arduino, it's close enough, call it an Arduino. <laughs> kind of like Kleenex, you know, the <laughs> cat's already out of the bag, can't put it back. Yes, Bill? My uh, balloon tracker uses the Atmel 328P, and I program it and uh, test it all in their Arduino. Yeah. So I guess you could call it an Arduino. Before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's an AT, Atmel AT328, which is the Uno, Nano, and the whole nine yards. So again, where do you draw that generic line? And since you're programming it with the Arduino environment, I call it an Arduino and be done with it. Let's not argue over the semantics of who's what, you know, just use it. Yes, sir. Can you? Uh, give an overview of development tool options, or is there only a single one? For the Arduino? Yes. Um, your number one tool, there are a couple other tools, but the Arduino IDE has been evolving through the years, and it's really the place to go. You can integrate all of the new boards just with a, and actually the library manager, you can say, you know, go add this new board, and it will add the board as a drop down menu in the IDE, so I would say the IDE is your one-stop shop for the Arduino. Uh, does it support Pico? Um, it will in that Arduino bootload. I do not believe it will in the Python. For that, you've got to go the recommended Python route, which is still relatively new to me. Yes, Bill? Uh, how hard is it to put the, boot, the Arduino bootloader on the Pico uh, Raspberry? No, my understanding, how hard is it to put the uh, Arduino image on the Pico? And basically, you hold the boot select button down, and it will go and pull down that bootload image off of a, it's basically a little mini computer. It, it reaches out and finds a shared drive, kind of like your USB becomes a shared drive when you hook it up to a PC. And it will find that image and pull it down. So you hold the boot select button, it pulls the image down. That's all you do. So you don't have to add a bootloader to it? No, it's got the bootloader. It just adds this as a bootload image. So then when you power up the board, now it's natively Arduino, and it will talk to the IDE just as if it was a standard Arduino board. Any other questions? Oh, come on. Did, did I totally stun you or bore you? How many of you are sleeping here? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm into uh, rocketry and we need altimeters uh, so we can deploy parachutes at altitude. I think somehow it's connected to the idea of the balloon. Yeah. Um, to do that, you have to have enough voltage right, to, to detonate the charge. Um, I feel it's used for that. A lot of people have done that. I've read about it, but I don't know anything about how, how to do it. Is now, what, what kind of weight are you talking about on your payloads? Uh, six pounds. Oh, you've got plenty of room for power then. Yeah, I mean, you can easily do it with an Arduino. Um, you know, think transistor driver or relay. Mm -hmm. uh, probably want a relay or something, something a little more fail-proof because you don't want the thing exploding on the ground. True. But um, yeah, it, you can easily do it with, with a little 5 volt relay or, or what have you. Right. Yeah. With that uh, telemetry. Yeah. Telemetry. Yeah. Well, you've got, well, video telemetry, the Arduino itself doesn't do video, but it can control the starting and stopping of a, a video recorder. <laughs> you're probably going to, if you've got to move into the video side, you're probably going to want something like a Raspberry Pi itself that has the video capability since it's basically a little Linux computer. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, if I want to power my Arduino or, or uh, Raspberry Pi uh, solely, I would imagine, uh, is there any you know, easy off-the-shelf uh, solar cell battery that would be sized for something as small as that? Um, Bill Brown, who's doing the high altitude balloon forum 
after me, he would be the one to talk to about low power because all of these balloon trackers are powered by solar cells. Oh, okay. okay. That, might, that brings up the question, what is the average current drain on this uh, Pi Pico? I meant to look that and up. How low can you get the current drain? Uh, I have been told it's very low, but I have not actually seen the specs. That was one thing that I kept overlooking. And I, every time I'd start to do that, I'd get called away on something. So I never really looked that up, but it, it's, it's very low. And it is been touted as a low power solution. So I would, I'm going to say very low. If you want to go low power, you probably want the version that doesn't have Wi-Fi on. Right. That would draw. Well, that's a separate Wi-Fi chip. So really what you want is the RP2040 chip and build from there. Because the actual memory is an external SPI bus memory. So it's however you want to roll it there. Or at least the ability, since I've only want to operate it a fraction of the time, to be remotely be able to turn it on and off. I believe it has sleep mode built up on the chip, yes. And I remember seeing this, it's just, I was trying to cram so much into what I had, but I just overlooked two and three things. Like I say, this is a brand new presentation. I was actually reading it because I don't remember writing it. <laughs> yeah. It's cool. I'm so glad to walk through this because I've looked at all these things and I'm like, this is taking so much of my brain. Right. That was the exact same thing. And then I hit the Pi Pico. And again, when AWO came to me and said, we want a, a Pico Python book, and I'm like, no. No, it's not where I want to be. No. And I kept getting subsequent news feeds and pieces, and I'm like, maybe I said no too soon. Yeah, it's all, it's hard. Yeah, so I, I went crawling back to AWRL, and I said, you were right, I was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Glenn, uh, what, uh, is there a, on the PyPico, is there a camera interface to the Arduino cam, or is that any way of interfacing the two? What, how does the Arduino cam interface? Uh, I know on some of the res bigger Raspberry Pi, there's a special connector. Okay, no, it doesn't have any video capability like that. If there's an Arduino library for a camera, then yes. Like an SPI type camera, yes. But outright, no. You know, th think of it as an Uno on steroids. It's the best way to look at it. I mean, when I saw the 133 meg, I was mm -hmm. like, cool. Then I saw the dual core, and I was like, it's cooler. <laughs> and then I saw that with the Python, you could run two simultaneous programs, and I'm like, whoa. Now we're getting into real-time operating system stuff. And when I saw the 133, uh, whatever the megahertz, my brain just froze. Uh, but I saw the speed on that. I was just like, this is exactly what I have been looking for. Now we're talking SDRs and all of that cool higher-end stuff. Yeah, Bill. Is there a way to run an Arduino program and a Python at the same time? Uh, no, because the bootloader is separate. Oh. You have to bootload the image into Flash. So, no. Now, the question I have is, what about that one that has the STM32 on the flip side? Yeah, how, how you know, it shares stuff. So, can you actually do both <clears throat> at the same time? That's going to be an interesting question. I'm going to say no because it shares too many resources and clock cycles and stuff. But you never know. And that could be the next step down the road. It might be multiplexed in there. Yeah. I, I just like the idea of, oh, turn the USB cable over and I got a different processor. Okay. Memory management. And I think we're going to start seeing a lot of that coming down the road. The hardware is becoming a com commodity now, really. And the software is this unified environment. It's the same thing on the Python side. They're, they're standardizing on the micro Python, the circuit Python. So you've got that one language to rule them all aspect again. You use their uh, development environment. I can't remember the name of it right now, but it's you know a single Python, but it's interpreted. So you can literally, you know, but you just use their editor. And so the, the Python side of it really is appealing, but I still love the Arduino because it's, you know, and this is why there's going to be a transition book on the Arduino on the Pico because there's just so many cool things you can do with dual 133 megahertz processors that you can't do. Yeah? Your book? Uh, another question. Can I've you got to sell books. Uh, can you throttle the uh, processor speed down to... That I don't know. I know you can do that on the teensy. 
Yeah, I'm not sure you can do that with the peacock. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't. I have not seen it, but I wasn't looking for it. Anybody else? Well, thank you. Yes, sir. I don't know if the, this is where that camera question was going, but um, my house is, I have, I have a bunch of the, the uh, uh, Pi interface camera. But I find the Pi Zero to be the easiest thing to work. Yeah. That has that interface and right. requires right. very little power. And then you can control storage, put your video feed up to NAS. Right. And, uh, you know, and it's cheap. It's cheap. Yeah. Well, I've got one. It's not cheap right now, but yeah. Yeah. A little hard to find right now. I got one. What's it worth? <laughs> I actually built one as using the, the Pika or the Pi W as a uh, a gas pump skimmer detector because I had my gas pump or my car, my credit card get skimmed at a gas pump, and what they are doing they are opening up the pump, sticking their board in between, and ribbon connectors all match and then they're transmitting the credit card data off on Bluetooth hmm. and I there was actually uh, make magazine had a Raspberry Pi uh, Pico version not Pico uh, zero zero version and I said no and I made an Arduino version and it actually it worked it also picked up every open Bluetooth signal on the highway. <laughs> <laughs> I could have fun with your GPS. <laughs> I could send you out in that next cornfield and you would never know it. <laughs> yes, sir. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed it. And next up is going to be Bill Brown and his high altitude balloons using an Arduino. No Python. All right, well, we're back, and uh, hey, Glenn, that was a great forum there, a lot of great questions at the end, and uh, looks like there's a lot of interest in the, this uh, new generation thing you're working on, man. Yeah, yeah it, it was a lot of fun to put together because this is something I've been looking for for like the last three or four years because, I, you know, we've all kind of started to outgrow the Uno and the Nano, and um, so I started looking at all the various options, and then I literally fell over backwards into this Raspberry Pi Pico. And it's, it literally is going to be my everything from here forward. Um, the, the Pico uh, with the Arduino code acts and looks and feels just like an Arduino. And then, of course, then you can uh, have the MicroPython code in it, and then you can start transitioning over to the Python uh, stuff which is even easier to program than the Arduino so to me it's a perfect all-in-one style chip and you can do Arduino or the mm -hmm. Python so that really is what I'm seeing my future is going to be so I'm looking forward to this it's going to be a lot of fun all right well great and thanks for uh, Frank thanks for doing that uh, Glenn well yeah and now I can talk about a little bit of that news that I had earlier yeah what was the news um and as I mentioned in the presentation, ARRL originally asked me to do a Raspberry Pi Pico book uh, based on Python. At that time, I wasn't ready, as you heard in the presentation here. But uh, I've been talking with Dave Minster at virtually every ham fest that I've been to uh, this year. And we've been fleshing out uh, where we're going to go. My next book will be a Arduino version of the Raspberry Pi Pico. In other words... We're going to use the Arduino uh, ecosystem, environment, whatever you want to call it, with the Raspberry Pi Pico and create some higher-powered Arduino projects. And then we're going to move over into the Raspberry Pi Pico and the MicroPython. So we're going to switch over and do a MicroPython book as part of this as well. So that's really like my next two books beyond the, the best of Arduino in the process. And uh, I still can't talk about some of the other books I've got going on because that's actually with someone else. Uh, but hopefully here in the next two or three weeks, I'll be able to spill the beans on that. And you'll be able to, you know, what I'll tell you right now, start saving up your pennies for these books because there should be roughly three, four, or five new ones here within the next two years. Man, I don't know how you do it. Mm. Well, that's why I'm thinking about retiring, so I have more time to do books. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the only way I can get it done. 
All right. Well, hey, thanks. Uh, thanks again. And uh, let me just make a quick announcement here uh, to everybody out there. Um, so this is this is really the, about the time we have the after the show show, and we're not going to have the after the show show tonight, guys, because Glenn and I really aren't here. Now we might be in a chat room. I don't know, uh, but uh, you, might can be. you can check the chat room out. We may be there. We may not be there. I don't. I don't know. It just depends on. We got some things going that uh, we got some conflicts here. But uh, so I uh, just would like to again just remind everybody out there, especially if you're listening on International Shortwave. Uh, you're uh, watching or listening to Amateur Radio Roundtable. It's a show about ham radio. We're on W5KUB.com every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Central Time. If you're listening to our show on shortwave, you're listening to us on Thursdays between 5 to 7 p.m. Um, Eastern Time on 7490 kilohertz. Uh, so join us on Tuesday nights if you can. Or just continue to watch us there. And uh, we thank you, everybody, so much for being with us tonight. Again, sorry that uh, we won't be doing it after the show show, but uh, uh, we'll be back next week, and and uh, we'll have some fun next week. 73, everybody, again, thank you for being with us. <laughs>